YouTube, it's Alien Dead again, and we're talking on another video, um, this time I wanted to talk about games with really, really bad microtransactions, so I found this on a website called Tom's Guide, um, basically it's, uh, 13 games with the worst microtransactions, so let's begin. Gamer Beware, remember when dropping $60 on a new game was the only transaction you'd have to make? That's rarely the case these days as almost all modern AAA titles from solo adventures like Shadow of War to sports franchises like Madden NFL are brimming with microtransactions that encourage you to drop a few extra bucks for some sort of in-game advantage. Plenty of games do microtransactions right. Overwatch, for example, doesn't let you pay for anything that affects gameplay, while others feel explicitly designed to nickel and dime the player at every turn. Here's some of the worst offenders, uh, games that are otherwise great but are loaded with microtransactions transactions you should absolutely avoid. Let's see, Shadow of Edel Middle Earth. And now you can buy it at $9, $18, or $20. Middle Earth Shadow of War is almost entirely a single player experience and one that throws powerful loot at you with reckless abandon. The inclusion of loot boxes in this game is not only confusing, but downright hurtful to the overall game. That's because you can buy loot boxes with in-game currency. But after a certain point, the amount of grinding you have to do, hours and hours, far exceeds the reward of a brief, true ending. Make no mistake, WB Interactive wants you to either fork over your hard-earned cash or waste your time for, for items that have a tangible effect on gameplay. And what you're buying is these orcs right here that you use apparently to do battle in the game. So you are legit having to play, pay to play the game. This is just like a mobile game. How fucked up is that? Evolve has <laughs> become extremely cheap now. Evolved launched in early 2015 at $60. As a, and it's a multiplayer only game. But that didn't stop publisher 2K from barding players play it uh, Bombarding players with pricey DLC options from day one, if you wanted to access every character, skin, and monster from the start, you would have to have paid up to $130. And, and you get two or three extra bosses, and the other characters are, are bleh. So this is how you kill your game. Some people bought it, thought, and people, I was hyped. I thought it was going to be great. And then it was like, meh. It was, I mean, it was great for maybe a month until everything just got boring and people are just like yeah fuck it let's move on and then it became free to play yeah it evolved no, not gear metal gear solid 5 let's see what abomination these this guy did because i wasn't aware 5 did anything bad I like to spend your headquarters into mobile forward operating bases, FOBs, that let you engage an online meta game component where players can invade one another bases and steal valuable resources such as soldiers, vehicles, and cargo. The ability to buy insurance for all such bases was patched post-launch and lets players purchase up to two weeks of security using in-game currency that you can earn or buy with real cash. Here's how it works. Anything or anybody that is stolen by your opponent can be replaced with the same exact thing as with real insurance. If you don't get attacked, you still have to pay the premium. The OFOP insurance takes away any real risk and strategizes, strategies involved in the 24k base management. So basically, you're paying money to no longer have fun in the game that you bought at $60 to have fun. Good job, guys. Good job. Assassin's Creed Unity and Syndicate. Alright, let's see where they fucked up here. The Assassin's Creed series has never locked any important game kind of behind a wall, save for substantial expansion packs, but Unity and Syndicate made users cough up money if they wanted to find it all. Up until Unity, you could scope out the locations of optional goodies simply by climbing to a high vantage point and sinking your map. That all changed with the introduction of Helix credits. A premium currency that's almost impossible to earn in-game. Helix credits are also the only way to buy maps that help you locate desirable collectibles or even important side quests. When Ubisoft said everything is permitted, we didn't think this was what that, what that meant. Marshall Honor of... Okay, Helix credits are the only way to buy maps that help you locate it 
help you locate desirable collectibles or even important side quests. Okay, do they mean help you locate important side quests or even allow you to do the important side quests at all? Because if this bullshit, just to buy the maps to help you find this shit, fuck it, YouTube, bam, easy peasy. Or, you know, don't be a lazy bastard and go exploring. Like, if, if all of that maps is just shows me where the shit is, then I don't care, but if it if it locks that shit behind it, yeah. Yeah, that's fucked up. Alright. Forza Motorsport 7. If you guys are a fan of racing games, I'm uh, playing South Park Rally and uh, um, Mario Kart, the original, or Mario Kart N64, you know. So if you guys want some real fun racing games with no DLC, that you actually can play with friends. All you need is an emulator and a second controller. And bam, you're good to go and have some fun. Fuck all this bullshit where you're buying 42 cars for $30 over a period of six months. Six months a car? Yeah, no. It just hit stores, but Forza Motorsport 7 is already infamous for having grossly egregious microtransactions. The game features prize crates that give you randomized goodies like cars and cosmetics for either in-game currency or real-world cash. That's harmless enough until you factor in mods, which are spe special race modifiers that you normally see only as a default option in Forza, and now can only earn through a loot box. So now you're taking away your fun by m having to buy it through random chances. While Forza Motorsport 7 is packed with tons of content out of the box, the fact that it gates off a basic feature in order to encourage you to buy prize crates is incredibly frustrating for a $60 game. DSX Mankind Divided Spending additional money on single player games is hard to stomach under the best of circumstances, but at least once you buy a cool item, it's yours to keep. Not so much with DSX Mankind Divided. His single player game not only charges real money left and right, but actually has the temerity to put price tags on single use consumable items. Ammo, credits, and crafting opponents work exactly one time in one playthrough and don't show up again if you start a new game on the same account. The weird thing is that you got plenty of these during the regular course of the game. They are microtransactions for the sake of microtransactions. Well, I mean, and honestly, in my opinion, if you're uh, getting it throughout the game, I mean, so what? Dead Space 3. Fans and critics generally like Dead Space 3. I actually have this, so um, let's see what's so bad. Well, I have the 360 version. For what successful combination of action, sci-fi, and horror, but the game introduced two extremely controversial features. The first was a co-op mode, which raised concerns about the balance between atmospheric horror and just shooting stuff for the fun of it. The second was microtransactions, one of the very first times a company had implemented them in a primarily single-player game. Upgrading weapons required components, which players could gather very slowly through optional missions or very quickly through real money. The system was unobtrusive but felt totally needless. Worse still, it set a bad precedent for a whole slew of single-player games to come. Yeah, because when you're implementing in stuff like this, that's how you can help kill your game, but... So, basically, this game's going to become a grind... ...for, uh, upgrading weapons. Wonderful. Well, I mean, if it's a fun game... I don't know, we'll see. Mass Effect 3. BioWare's 2012 epic space adventure Mass Effect 3 features a surprisingly addictive co-op multiplayer mode. Which grew pretty robust thanks to a steady stream of new maps, features, characters. The problem is you can unlock new characters only via randomized loot crates, meaning that required a bunch of online stuff. I mean, I'm not an online player, but for all you online guys, I'm so sorry you have to deal with this bullshit. Uh, all money grubbing, yeah. See, I mean, you're taking away your fun. Tails! Uh, apparently it's a whole series. 2008 to present, which is your favorite part of having a Japanese RPG. Levy up your party slowly. Over time, expanding your inventory of powerful items, collecting crazy costumes for your characters, the Tales series has aggressively monetized all three and even withholds features it used to give away for free. Since Tales of Vespera in 2008, players have since been able to pay for experience levels and healing items, pay for experience levels and healing items, which can completely break the game's balance early on, 
So basically you're paying for cheats. What's really egregious though is that players have to pay money for swimsuits, formal wear, and legacy costumes for previous tales, games, all of which used to be on, earned through side quests. Basically all this stuff used to be three. Think about it through cheat codes. Um, I mean if you're a PC player, you know, that should obviously, you know, piss you off. NBA 2K18. Part of the appeal of NBA 2K is building up your own superstar in the My Career mode, but doing so can be a long, frustrating grind if you're not willing to pay real cash for the game's virtual currency. Everything from attributes, so that's basically how good your player is, and special dunks, so you want to look flashy while playing the game, and haircuts and tattoos cost a lot of VC, meaning you'll either need to be extremely patient or pull out your wallet just to be able to customize your player. Really? So you can have a military-ish looking haircut, a funky one, like you just got electrocuted, basic spikes, uh, <laughs> it gets lower, bald, <laughs> a slightly uh, roughy, ruffled fro, another ruffled fro, Diablo 3, were so bad Blizzard had to take them out of the game when they first came out. It leaned heavily on an auction house feature. This controversial addition to the series let players trade powerful weapons among themselves for either in-game currency or real money. This might not have been a problem except the game was extremely stingy with powerful loot, almost forcing players to spend more time in the auction house than they did adventuring. Thankfully, Blizzard closed the auction house and rebalanced the game, making it closer to the classic Diablo formula players know and love. Hey Diablo players, guess what's coming up? Diablo Immortal! Ooh! And guess what? All the p people that made those games are quitting now because the div Blizzard's like, fuck you! So that's gonna be a shit show. Guitar Hero! Yeah, you had to buy the music. Not surprising. More Combat X! Um. <laughs> yeah, you're buying fatalities. So, I mean, hey, I mean, if you are frustrated with never being able to perform a fatality, hey, here you go. And, uh, that's our <laughs> microtransaction game rant. Because that was atrocious. Simply atrocious.